I went to Parliament on Monday uh-huh. with Mahi and a camera crew to interview Chris Hopkins. Oh. And you know, like when you're traveling with a camera crew and there's those like funny doors in the press gallery and it's hard to get through and we mm. like couldn't get through and I wasn't wearing my glasses mm. and I saw this button and it said press hard. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Mahi goes, don't press that. And it was too late. I'd lost control late. of my arm by then. What could you do? And it was the fire alarm. <laughs> and I set off the fire alarm. Did and you evacuate the, the order I, of parliament? Oh, that's what I was so scared was going to happen. But anyway. Is, is this how we inadvertently found out that, like, the fire plan for parliament is just to let the press gallery <laughs> die? <laughs> 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 they just, like, make sure the fire's contained in the wing. And, like, that, that button is still connected to a, a text message that goes off in Trevor Mallard's pocket. <laughs> 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 It's gone by lunchtime with your friends Annabelle Lee Mather. Kia ora. Ben Thomas. Morena. And our very own Rick Rubin, Samuel Robinson. Hello. Uh, it's Wednesday, September 6. There are 38 days to election day. There are 26 days to advance voting starts. There are 110 days till Christmas. And it's very much campaign mode because as we speak uh, on the agendas of the two Chrises who could be Prime Minister, Chris. For Luxon is at Rockin' Gelato in Christchurch. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris Hipkins is currently at an innovation centre to see robotic arms developed for use in horticulture and research. I know where I'd rather be. So it's like six o'clock gold, you know, six o'clock news gold <laughs> already. Who knows what will happen with that? Something about scoops, possibly. And good news for political podcast lovers, Ben. There's a whole slew of new ones uh, out there on the on the pod waves ahead of the election. If, if you're a gone by lunchtime listener, you will love the you will love New Zealand political podcasts, a genre invented by us. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> and boy howdy, with the election drawing closer, they have never been thicker on the ground. Um, there is a new political podcast uh, that dropped this week uh, called "What's the Story, Old Glory," mm. hosted by. For, recently retired MP Todd Muller mm. and the former chief executive of Irrigation New Zealand, keeping us up to date on the US election trail it's ahead un- of 2024. Unmissable. Wow. Um, if you wondered what was going to happen to Todd Muller's deep, <laughs> stentorian, <laughs> velvety tones <laughs> after his retirement from politics, wonder no longer. <laughs> Wow. Uh, because he is going to keep it. They've undertaken to keep us company for the next 15 months uh, leading up to polling in the presidential election. Um, those are all the new political podcasts. Amazing. Can't Today wait. on the agenda, we have Nationals Tax Plan, Labour's Need to Pledge, the rival launches, tech ads, and a guest spot from Nelson Mandela. But first, we were in Christchurch on the weekend before last, hosted by Word Christchurch. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we made to feel very welcome. Very intelligent audience. Great audience. Very intelligent audience, genuinely. Leanne Delziel was there and the bad boys of Brexit were there. Um, and it was fun. But uh, we were, as you expect, we were mobbed by lunchies as mm. we left the uh, uh, left the theatre. Mm. One of whom in New Regent Street, Kurt. Kurt. Hello, Kurt. Demanded to know. He was very upset. He was very upset in a nice way mm. that we had omitted to mention one of the main kind of political strands in Aotearoa of late. And that specifically is, and I'm going to put this to you, your pigeon situation. yeah. yeah. Um, the pigeons are fine. There's a lot of them. They've had a tough winter, mm-hmm. um, but they're in trouble. There's trouble on the horizon. Like inflation is finally going to bite for the pigeons because yeah. I feed them my kids leftover school sandwiches in the morning. But why, why, do, why, why, why would you do that? Because I just find it hard to like throw kite okay. in the rubbish. But the cost of living crisis means that you can no longer well, <laughs> give them the sandwiches. Well, no, it's more that I've actually been given one of those new green... Wheelie bin thing, so now I don't feel so guilty oh, putting scraps, putting bread in the things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they're going to be doing it tough. They're going to be very much in the squeezed middle between native birds and I don't know what people. People, yeah. Speaking of the squeezed middle, um, as we elegantly segue towards matters in politics, National launched its tax plan last week, didn't it? Yes, it did. And that tax plan, which was um, much awaited had promised 
many benefits for the proverbial squeezed middle um, in the form of shifting around of tax brackets, which have kind of, you know, what do they, what do they call it, fiscal creep, has meant that people have moved up through the tax brackets, so addressing that, and also some shifts to on tax credits. And um, they did a tax calculator, and they calculated everything by the fortnight, which turns out um, fortnightly savings are twice those of weekly savings, and therefore, really? and therefore a larger amount of money. It included, um, uh, in order to pay for all of that, uh, there's um, some some pretty major cutbacks in terms of public service, uh, but also they introduced four new revenue measures, one of which wasn't uh, having a go at sanitarium, <laughs> which some of us got very <laughs> excited about over a few hours there. Um, wasn't that. There, but, the, there, but two of those, Ben, two of those um, have come under scrutiny in the days since. I, I think it landed pretty well, the tax plan. It's, it's, I it's think it landed, I landed, it landed particularly well. I think, um, what did Jenna Lynch call it? Political marketing genius. Gee, right. um, yeah, and it, and it did. It, it sort of had this almost kind of crystalline lattice sort of appearance of crystalline just this, this perfectly kind of mm. sculptured and architected mm. um you know, as if as if created by a robot arm in a lab <laughs> in being the, visited in by the, the prime minister. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, frozen yogurt made by AI. Since then, I, uh, I don't know if a, a crystalline lattice can unravel, but parts of it have come under greater scrutiny, and there are two particularly. There's the tax on offshore gambling, uh, which will require some new legislation. The law there is kind of pretty old porridge, really, but also this tax on... It would require gamblers not to take risks. It would require, <laughs> it would, it would require gamblers with VPNs, yeah. not to gamble with a VPN. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a great point. Um, and then this, the, because foreign ownership of New Zealand property would be reopened on properties over $2 million, then there would be a tax of 15%, and that has uh, uh, been... Questioned by some, not just the Grant Robertson, but actually people who you know, people who are, who are nonpartisan tax experts, blah blah blah, uh, in terms of a whether or not the revenue is there that they need, and b whether or not it would be a breach of not so much free trade agreements, but the tax treaties. How how do you sense Ben that that has played out in terms of the crystalline lattice, the let, let, lattice crystals, the gelateria? Of life, has has Nationals' original um, uh, plan started to to look a bit crumblier? Yeah, I, I think with some of these questions arising, particularly around, I think the foreign uh, the foreign buyer um, tax or fee, as it's been recast, um, more a bit more like a sort of crystalline gleaming Jenga set, um, mm. you know, and look. I'm, I'm going to put my hand up and say I'm not particularly well qualified to talk about the law around ta- international tax treaties. Um, and honestly, it's not something that occurred to me at all when I was writing my first sort of response to it mm. uh, in a column last week. And with the criticism that sort of come out, um, so there, there are two there are two real criticisms of this this plank of the revenue raising arm of the the policy. The first is. It may not raise, you know, the, the, the assumption that it will raise seven hundred and forty, I think, million dollars a year is seems quite high. It's been described as heroic. Heroic's uh, got a lot of a lot of work lately. I love the use of heroic <laughs> in that term. It's very nice. Uh, and, and and the second is that it may not actually be possible without sort of alienating our trading partners and, and breaching various undertakings. On the second part, um, there has there's been a lot of criticism, but most of that has been from economists, from David Parker. Um, it was interesting, Robin Oliver, um, a former Deputy Commissioner of IRD um, and you know, generally acknowledged as sort of yeah. kind of the tax guru kind of in the private You said, sector. ah, it's fine. Yeah, he, he said actually that's sort of fine. Just um, got to word it carefully. Yeah, and, and then you, you kind of get into this <laughs> argument of sort of national said, well, as long as we call it a fee rather than a tax, which I think was a separate point to the one that Robin Oliver was making, uh, we can we can do it, and then you kind of reach the objection of like, well, if you already debuted it as a tax in your press release, yeah. and then you sort of say to overseas investors, actually, it's just a fee. And we're talking about a tax? typo. What are yeah, you like what? About? <laughs> like, um, <laughs> right? No, oh, no, those were just no taxes notes. here. Just some fees. <laughs> just these fees. Uh, um, and so you know, there, there is a certain kind of fiction around it. Um, 
So look, I I don't know. I'm gonna have to, I'll, I'll have to defer to the experts on that in terms yeah. of the, well, is it technically doable? In terms of the assumption, you know, the assumptions around around raising the money certainly does seem a high number. That could probably be uh, maybe explained. You could maybe explain it with pent up demand. You could also say people have said, "Well, there's a property crash coming to China." I mean, to me, that's that suggests a reason for investing in a rule of law country with a an artificially propped up property market under any circumstances yep. yep. in New Zealand. So, I mean, th- that's just sort of arguable. Whether they will be able to get the full seven hundred million dollars a year from it, uh, yeah. Look, it, it's. Certainly seems you might want to price that in at a discount when you're considering the tax settings. Uh, at the same time, as we'll get on to, you know, all of this may become immaterial once Prefu is announced yeah. next week, where we'll see that actually all of the parties are doing a bit of an but, imaginative but, exercise. But interestingly, National has, uh, uh, Nicola Willis has been very clear that the, the, the tax pledges are locked in. And they've they in order to kind of um, forestall those questions around yep. whether or not that she's like, no, that's locked in. Annabelle, you are an international tax expert. Uh, what is your assessment of uh, these questions around um, the if, measures? If I was to use a national term to describe them mm. in terms of um, the the gambling tax and the um, the fee, the new fee, fee. international it's buyers' fee, fee. fee. Um, I would fee say it's fee. definitely bringing a strong rinky dinky vibe. Mm. And if you if you aren't a tax expert like I am, mm-hmm. um, then I strongly suggest you watch Jack Tame's interview with Nicola Willis yeah. um, last Sunday, where he carefully peels apart the entire policy. And I think probably the most telling part of that interview is when um, Jack asks Nicola Willis if she'll release the full model because the numbers just don't make sense that uh, in order to achieve the amount of of revenue needed you'd need 28% of New Zealand houses to be bought by Mm. foreign buyers when pre- COVID, I can't remember what the percentage was or the way it works but it was around 3% um, so, I mean, Nicola Willis is a smart woman and I reckon she probably knows all her timetables right up to 15. So that makes me that makes me wonder in terms of the two million, do they know that actually that number's not going to work and they're just presenting well, it as a, things, here's a it? number for now it, and then in two years' time they'll be like, that well, number didn't well, quite they hit all, it. They all are because they're all based on forecasts, right? And so there is this, this is the fiscal hole idea is all about showing a hole in the spreadsheet rather than saying that these numbers will be what plays out. Yeah, I mean, the, the numbers add up, right? It's just where you can, yeah. And where, then there is 700 million dollars. That's where the heroic bit comes you know. into play, isn't it? I mean, the one thing, you know, talking about rinky-dinky, I'll tell you what, the international tax experts such as you have really got their mojo back mm. as a result of this policy, which is very exciting for everyone. Jack Tame is on fire at the moment, or holding people's feet to the fire on both parties. He was very, he was very tough on Chris Hipkins on the weekend as well. Shout out to Jack Tame. Uh, the other policy uh, of recent times was Labor's, which was announced at their launch. We'll get onto the launches in a second, which is... We've talked about the year 2026 on this podcast a bit before and how incredible it's going to be. Uh, (laughs) Expanding dental care, I think it's to the age of 24, maybe, 24 or 25 by 2025, and then uh, to um, people up to the age of 30 or under 30 uh, by 2026, Annabelle, and that's... It's interesting. That's the eighth of their ten cost of living measures. It's kind of it's kind of weird because the cost of living crisis, I think everybody agrees, is right now. But the solution is <laughs> sometime in the future. So it's sort of when when the cost of living crisis won't be as acute. But you know, this is a, is 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 more ambitious than some of the other stuff. As other people have noted, during that launch, the Labor Party launch, GST of fruit and vegetables was not mentioned once. So that has been a, that has not gone down so well. There were various people uh, saying, why not do something a bit more ambitious like uh, expanding uh, eligibility for you know, dental care univers- in the universal health system? Uh, is this one going to be more effective? Does it matter that it's a few years from now? 
It's a game changer. Sorry to say that word. That's okay. You can Sorry. say game changer. I don't, I don't. I think it'll, will it change the game? I don't know. Will more people play the game? Perhaps. Mm. I think that, I think that it's a, it's a policy that will have wide appeal and it will, not only will it appeal to the people in their age bracket, but I think also their parents who are currently acting as bank of mum and dad and forking out for um, people's dental care, if your parents can actually afford it. Um, I think it's a step in the right direction. It's not as comprehensive as the Greens dental policy, but if you guys listen to this podcast, you'll know that dental care is one of my pet peeves. And I, what I would really like to see from anyone is a dental plan that addresses what's happened to our kids' dental care. You know, when we were kids and we had the murder house, the joy of calling out the next person who oh, has to go house. to the murder house. Do you remember those little little cotton wool bees they used to make? Did you yes, ever get those yes, with like yes, bits yes. of cotton yeah. and stuff? Sort of which made it even more sinister and terrifying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These kind of crazy little draped little <laughs> tiny insects that were meant to make you feel better as they drilled deep into your gums. My mum says these trainees for the first time <laughs> getting in there. My mum says when she was a kid, they'd literally put mercury in your hand oh and let God. it like roll around in oh a ball. But anyway, God. the point that I want to make is when we took um, dental nurses out of our kids' school, mm. we've basically damned generations of children to not getting access to dental care because even though they talk about the mobile buses and you can get called into clinics and that, for people whose parents don't have um, the luxury of being able to take half a day off school to ferry your kid to and from those dental clinics mm. or if your kid happens to be sick on the day the dental bus turns up, um, those kids aren't getting the care that they need and that, that those problems follow them through until adulthood. So I think um, in an ideal... I, I'm daring you guys. I'm putting the challenge out there. Come on, act. Come on, National. I know you guys want it. Try and trump them. Go Māori Party. Was it Go Greens. That, interesting Let's that, bring back the murder that, house. That, that, that bring back the murder <laughs> house. Like, it's, it's a great way to also do like youth offending. Like if you pay out, rip their teeth out. Well, cross, cross, party, cross party agreement on the murder house amendment bill of 2024. I think you'd want it more specifics because they might have they might all have different visions of what that entails. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Ben, the, 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 the policy, as announced, um, came into criticisms, including how are you going to achieve this if you've only got, like, one of the 20 mobile dental units that you promised at the last election? And the Dental Association, or whatever they're, whatever they're called, said, oh, this is too expensive. Graham said, no, no, we've factored that in. Um, obviously, there aren't the dentists, so they, that's one another reason apart from lacking the money. They need to get some more dentists in. They put them on the super green list. Um your take. <laughs> set, a, set aside a three-bedroom house in Papakura to whack 50 of them in. <laughs> like, wow. um, That's a movie. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, look, I, I mean, look, popular, I'm sure it'll be a popular policy. Um, you know, you wouldn't find too many people who are against dental care. Um, like Annabelle, Annabelle was saying, you know, even for middle-class people, the, the, the spectre of going to the dentist and then finding out how much the bill will be down the for your next appointment is enough, you know, it's enough to put me off. You, you are, know, go, you are going to the know. dentist like, literally after this podcast. I'm literally going really, to, yeah. This is real experiential yeah. podcasting. If we just keep, if we is. keep the tape rolling and the pressure keeps <laughs> on the politicians, it might be free. You know what? Let's just keep, let's keep podcasting. Yep. Yep, totally. It's because um, when I was with each of my children when I was pregnant, like it's really hard on your teeth. So I like, my teeth were. I had a. Anyway, mm. it's a long story. Right. Also, it's a very expensive long story. Also, those years in Ibiza. I mean, they had an impact too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I <laughs> Um, yeah, so you know, it's, it, the, the only way you can you can't criticise the policy as sort of misguided because I think it it, it does you know it would help a lot with access issues. Um, you know, the, the the real basis for criticising it, I think, or the vulnerability for Labour is, you know, they haven't been very good at delivering anything. Um, you know, where, where Labour have delivered, I think I've said a billion times before, is things where they can literally just solve it with a stroke of a pen, increasing the minimum wage. 
you know, hugely mm-hmm. successful in that, massive increases in the minimum wage, because all it takes is a, is for the minister to sign something in the executive increasing, council. Increasing benefit levels. Yeah, increasing benefit levels, same thing. You know, you've got to find the money from somewhere, but that's easy enough. You borrow money, you you borrow money from overseas. Building hundreds of thousands of houses under Kiwi. Oh, no, no, no. Can I, can, <laughs> can, but on that, you know, Labor actually has done a good job in terms of building up our housing stock again. The mistake they State made... State social housing, yes. Yeah, this, the mistake they made was over-promising what Kiwi Build was going to do, you know, like some magical thinking. Mm. But, you know, that's also the risk of, of the tax plan, the, the fee being proposed by by National. That it's just going to... We're just trying to dig our way out of a housing crisis and we're going to open up the market again when there's no like, there's no backup plan for for more housing to be built with 28 percent supposedly of our housing stock over two million being sold off. So you know it's a real danger in that regard. We had over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday a kind of launch off, a launch versus launch. Labor Party had their campaign launch on Saturday at the Aotea Centre. National Party had theirs at the Dew Drop Centre in South Auckland on Sunday, formerly known as the Vodafone's Event Centre. I went to both of those. Uh, they, I think they both parties would be reasonably happy with theirs. Um, there was some reporting, as people would have seen, of um, five interruptions to the Labour Party launch by uh, Brian Tamaki's um, uh, um, flock, shall we say, and they popped up like Jack in the box, or like whack a moles, and then they were dragged out happily for Labour. Was the that dude one, inside like the most beautifully dressed protester you've the guy, ever seen? He had seen? tiger print on his blazer. It's like a beautiful, yeah. sort of florally blazer. That guy blazer came last nice in a local chinos. board election. In the, <laughs> but, but yes, it was a good blazer. It was a good blazer. It was a it was beautiful a good blazer. blazer. And at first it wasn't clear because he stood up and sort of raised his arms, and it wasn't clear was that he was, Helen Clark was speaking. Mm. And I think she thought, oh, this is very nice. Very, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, good to be. Yeah. Hailed him this minute and him for a while. <laughs> Doesn't happen when I go to the WHO. Good to see. Uh, and then, um, and then, and then he sat down. And then he stood up again. I think maybe someone. Was, and then he stood up again. He's right in the middle of the stalls, you know. And it's like to, it's really it's, this, it was sort of uh, by by design, I think, so difficult to drag out. But it was good for the event to some extent. A because it, the first one happened during Helen Clark's. Very good speech, which again I think was probably designed as a little in part to go 2005, everybody, and she kind of hinted at it. Um, but also, it meant that they had a trial run, they had a practice. So by the time they started popping up during Hipkin's speech, they knew what the drill was, which is go sort of start saying, What were they chanting? Go Labour Go or something like that. And then other people would hold up. Uh, bright red Labour T-shirts to kind of surround them so that they weren't available. And Mike Williams got involved at one point, wow. sort of strong-arming somebody. <laughs> um, but but it actually kind of roused them a bit. The crowd who were it was a deep, reasonable sized crowd there. Yeah. They they kind of they kind of got animated by it all. So it sort of in a in a way worked worked to the, worked to their advantage. Mm. Um, and it was a bit more of a kind of. They obviously didn't want to do it in the town hall because then it would be too tempting to do comparisons with 2017 and 2020, particularly mm-hmm. 2017. You know, but but it didn't feel it 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 didn't feel like a kind of uh, 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 overly sober or or whatever. It didn't feel too bread and butter. It was quite a Reb Fountain saying because Don McGlashan, shout out to Don McGlashan who um, has been in well. Hope you get a bit of Don. Mm. Um, then the next day, National. Was m- much more glitzy and glamoury. I described in it, it in a in piece. It's heartland of Monaco. Well, yeah, yeah, I was like, did they? Well, ha- they would have had to definitely Google search where the dewdrop is. Eh? <laughs> I, I did think maybe a few well, delegates might like, get where lost am I? along I'm the way. So <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> the, the last time they did an event there was when Judith Collins was the leader of the party in. Not that long ago, it was the 2021 National Party Conference. Oh, was the last yeah, time no, I for a National Party that. event. Um, and that was quite a different energy, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> that was when um, old David Carter was getting really cross about the presidency and Judith Collins was faking questions about Chris Bishop having... Uh, being, he said something in a direct message about um, not being for the um, conversion the therapy. Conversion yeah. therapy. But anyway, it was just you know that was a those were bad times. This was a much better time, and the mood was it wasn't euphoric, and I think they, they, were, they were trying to go for that a bit. But it was there was a sense of kind of genuine confidence. You know, you could just tell a sort of expectation. I think, and they went very. 
it went very kind of like Las Vegas and, and, and the Auckland suburbs. I described it in my piece as being like part like a kind of build up to a UFC title fight and part like a school hockey prize giving. You know, it had that kind of they called all the all the candidates out to the stage, name by name, to the stage, like this, da, da, da. And everyone sort of cheered and held up their signs and then and um you sort of I wanna imagine the, it as like a sale of the century vibe. Oh yeah. With like the Steve MPs Power. like oh, sliding <laughs> their socks. I want them to slide oh, down in their socks and Luxon is like like Steve Parr and Nicola Willis as Judith Kirk. Wow. Well, yeah, I don't know. I don't, that's I mean, the I energy that's that. Good. I I I don't I, know why you are not earning more money doing these sorts of events. Thank you. I reckon I'd be amazing. You would be it. amazing. <laughs> you would be amazing. Yeah. Well, one thing that we forget about Luxon because people sort of see him as oh, he's the staid sort of business guy. His background is actually in marketing and advertising, right? <laughs> and branding and. You know, I think you know the first staff member that he hired when he became an MP because you know you only get sort of enough funding for one person in Parliament, and he hired somebody whose primary skill was videography. Right, and you know, so I think I think we're, do we're starting. That, do you remember that video that was that yeah, we played the, the, early right. on? Yeah, the, the, the kind of pimp walk <laughs> so to his made it was in so speech. funny. The this is like, <laughs> ch- like chopped and screwed kind yeah, of music yeah, yeah, yeah. that sort of. Oh, I gotta um, find that. Gotta find that. And, uh, yeah, and I, and I think that's sort of coming back, that kind of the, the sort of visual way that he sort of sees sees the world, you know, in terms of sort of advertising, branding, images, that kind of thing. Mm. And I think we got a bit, a bit of an, uh, a flash of that mm. uh, at the launch. Um, yeah, you know, I thought I, I, I didn't go to either. I couldn't sort of rouse myself. But um, it was, yeah, I, I thought they both played pretty well on on TV for the the sorts of things that both of them would have been going for. Labour really tried into formula by now, you know, the New Zealand musicians, the yeah. live performance, the you know sort of cultural cultural sort of performances and greetings, and you know, and the kind of rah rah kind of rally, um, and and national have sort of you know even before Lux and have been kind of trending more towards these kind of TV set pieces. Yeah, um, I mean, the thing you don't see on the TV versions, of course, which is a really important part of it, is the earlier speakers go very hard on knock on the doors, hand out a million pamphlets. We need you out, you know. So there is there is a, a good part of the 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 motivation for these events is to rally the troops yep. to get the volunteers kind of amped and up for it and i think from from that point of view both were reasonably successful the 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 monday morning i think it was monday morning annabelle uh we woke to the front page of the herald with these um images of Christopher Luxon, look, you know, with a little bit of like, I think whoever designed these ads for the CTU was probably given re- reference points that included Robert Muldoon and, and and Benito Mussolini, and it says out of touch, too much risk, and this is the my question for you really is: Is this the most exciting thing to happen to New Zealand print journalism since Harvey Norman? <laughs> like <laughs> wrap around <laughs> these, ra- they're all going to go for it now. It's like this is this is this is gold, or. Is Harvey Norman going to have a go at Noel Leeming on Saturday on the weekend here, or is it just going to be <laughs> Harvey? What do you, what do you think? Possibly. I mean, I mean, was there? Sorry, the thing that I find interesting about it is, from a you know, as a journalist, is that a, a, a newspaper like the Herald would give its front page mm-hmm. to such a political um, advertisement. Like this, and and the other thing that's running on um, the Herald website too is um, is um, what's it called? Um, reality check radio ads. Um, so yeah, I thought it was an an unusual decision by the Herald to run something like this at election time. It's a time. tricky one. Isn't I mean, of course, where do you draw it's the, the line? Front, it's just, uh, I mean, technically, it's not the front page. It's a sort of it's a wrap wraparound around. kind of fake front yeah, page. But, you know. kind of, yeah, but, but you're right. Everyone I mean, says, is it, oh, is it, is it a the page Herald. at the front? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. No, so, you know. As someone else pointed out, above the fold, it just says Christopher Luxon. So if you, <laughs> if you can see it on some of the newsstands, you'll be like, oh, that's a, you know, it mm. sounds good. There is a bit like, there is some of that risk and a slightly different version of what we talked about before when the ACT Party ran... Uh, digital billboards with Winston Peters' face on them, grinning wildly. And in this case, Ben, I mean, there are two things. One is uh, whether or not pe- how how 
we don't know. But how do people respond to that? Do they think, oh, yes, that makes me question that guy? Do they think that's a bit underhand? And then also, it kind of wiped out of the lead of the stories all of the discussion which we had earlier about the questions that are swirling around uh, Nationals uh, tax slash, what do we call it, fee. Yeah, Ed, Edward Elder, who's a marketing academic at Auckland, I thought he actually gave a sort of good account of this on RNZ where he said, you know, traditionally, well, you know, negative ads are not, nothing new in New Zealand at all, uh, but traditionally they've been done with a kind of, you know, a bit of a kind of tongue-in-cheek, sort of slightly kind of quote unquote funny, you know, even even if in like, even the John, Cossacks. Even, even the John, Cossacks were a bit even, jolly. <laughs> yeah, even even in John Key's case, kind of bordering a little bit on anti Semitic jokes, but you know, but but they were intended to be Were they? Sort of, what were those? Oh, you know, the sort of shonky and, you know, international uh, banker uh, stuff. Right, but yeah, you okay. know yeah. um but there was always sort of this tinge of like at least we're trying to be a little bit funny and and here it was here it's just sort of Almost, it seems like it's like random snippets they might have grabbed from a focus group or something. You know, was it too too much risk or something? Like, yeah. not not a sort of naturalistic kind of way of talking or, or writing, but um, yeah. And so, so I I, I I tend to think it'll you know it'll it'll backfire. Um, you know, and, and I think he also observed. You know, it allows it allows Christopher Luxon, who actually, you know, I think Luxon himself is very free from personal attacks, not so much in the National Party as a whole, but allows them to sort of go, you know, kind of get clutch the vapors a little bit pills, and say, yeah. well, yeah. we, Christ, we are very disappointed yeah. in the <laughs> negative tenor. <laughs> to the which, negative tenor of this corrupt, awful, failed To which Chris is. Tipkins responded with, uh, you know, a massive dossier of... You know the, mm. the 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 color printer on the ninth floor of the Beehive <laughs> yeah. got a real workout, and they produced a whole bunch of ads by uh, you know alleged proxies of the National Party, which had various yeah. I, th- I think of com- com- in the, the end tech- doesn't Annabelle, in the end doesn't this just have the impact of people kind of being a bit put off the whole the whole thing, particularly National Labour? Yeah, I think it's just seen as unseemly. And to be fair, there was nothing funny about the Ewe Kiwi ads that were being run during the the um, Don Brash era. Um, I I mean, I I think this is fairly tame. Like, it's not incredibly um, nasty or personal. Um, I do think that Labour's response to this has been stronger than than Nationals. I I feel like the way um, Chris Bishop tried to sort of joke it off um, when he was called out by a journalist for actually reposting that stuff... (laughs) Um, <laughs> doesn't there was per- doesn't. perfect perfect posters brain like, we're all just I don't know what it is we're I all post, we're all just I can't we're all just, take responsibility for what I post on this we're, we're all just piggies <laughs> wandering into the the timeline the the content slop just flowing through the holes in our brains like yeah <laughs> I, I I don't think um I, I don't think this has hurt labour but I I do think that. It probably has hurt National, not necessarily through the ad itself, but through the way it's um, given Labour an opportunity to talk about the the way they've been portrayed, you know, people like Nanaya Mahuta and so on. So, yeah. We've got to send you out of here to the grown-up murder house, but quickly before we leave. The um, homicide house, that's what they call it when you're grown up. Do they? Yeah. Fancy. The uh, <laughs> homicide palace. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> uh, David Seymour continues to <laughs> entertain us with his history <laughs> curriculum, added to the list which already included Nelson Mandela, Hone Heke, all of the um, chiefs who signed the Treaty of Waitangi is now Kate Shepherd, who would also have been out there uh, eagerly voting for the Association of Consumers and Taxpayers. Any other suggestions of historical figures that would have certainly voted Act? Mini Deans. <laughs> I was thinking Moses, you know, like he, I can imagine him with a big magenta rosette. Ben. Uh, I I should have worked up something on this. Um, no, I I like the <laughs> Malcolm X. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's sorry. I should have warned you. I was going to ask that. You know, that, it's, it's just you know, like you know, pe- people always talk about a zombie apocalypse, but it's it's, it's not that. It's just act early voters. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, the next, the next policy launch from the Act is they're going to extend the franchise to dead people. <laughs> All right, that's us. Let's go. Go to the dentist. Good luck out there, Annabelle. We'll be back very soon. Kia ora. Kia ora.